the uh, issues a little bit better. Yes, I think uh, Mark has written a very important work. I think there's definitely things to discuss and debate, but um, very, very profound insights for me about the role of Christianity. Um, I'm essentially taking a position that personally, I think I'll refer to it as the doctrine of Christian discovery, um, just because I think people need to associate the discovery, the doctrine of discovery with Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen Newcomb uh, references it that way quite frequently as well. And as, as well as many others. So we yeah. are, uh, we are here on YouTube and we've already gathered five people. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you, uh, Mark, and then uh, it'll be your floor. Uh, so uh, my name is Skip Conover. I'm one of the co-hosts of the Wisdom Path Colloquia. And today we're going to hear from author Mark Charles, who's written a book called Unsettling Truths, The Ongoing Dehumaniz Dehumanizing Legacy of the doctrine of discovery. And I'll just read a short description of this. Mark went to a, um, went to a demonstration in Washington once that was uh, in honor of Christopher Columbus, am I right? <laughs> and, and he says, you can't discover lands already inhabited to the various participants. But anyway, uh, I'll just read the a little bit from the back cover. In this prophetic blend of history, theology, and cultural commentary, Mark Charles and Sung Chan Ra reveal the far-reaching damaging effects of the doctrine of discovery. In the 15th century, of church, official church edicts gave Christian explorers the right to claim territories they discovered, quote unquote. This was institutionalized as an implicit national framework that justifies American triumphalism, white supremacy, and ongoing injustices. The result is that the dominant culture idealizes a history of discovery, opportunity, expansion, and equality, while, my, uh, while minority communities have been traumatized by colonization slavery, segregation, and dehumanization. Um, healing begins when deeply entrenched beliefs are unsettled as other nations have instituted truth and reconciliation commissions. So do the authors call our nation and churches to a truth telling that will expose past injustices and open the door to, rec to conciliation and true community. So welcome, uh, Mark, and I look forward to hearing about your book. Thank you, Skip. Uh, as we would say in Navajo, Akihak. I appreciate the invitation and I appreciate your introduction. Before we begin, please allow me to introduce myself traditionally. So, yes, sure. Mark Charles Yanishia, Sin Bekei Dinan Nishwa, the Tohiglini Bachachin, Sin Bekei Dinan Dasha Che, the Tohiglini Dinan Dasha Nala. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. So my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say Tsin Bekei Dene. Loosely translated, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people <laughs> um, the, with the clomping. And, uh, and so I refer to my, my mother's mother in that way. My, my second clan, my father's mother, is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Dene. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, which is the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. Um, I also want to acknowledge I'm speaking to you today from what's now known as Washington, D.C., but these are the traditional lands of the Piscataway. And it's the Piscataway who, uh, they were the people who were living here, hunting here, farming here, fishing here, raising their families here, burying their dead here, long before Columbus got lost at sea, and they are still here. 
And so I've had the honor of meeting some of the Piscataway. I've been welcomed to the land by the Piscataway. I want to publicly state how humbled I am to be living on these lands. And I want to thank the Piscataway for their stewardship of these lands. Um, for those of you who are interested as to the lands where you are living, there is a website that I use frequently. It's native-land.ca. It's a very good website. I believe it's actually um, out of Canada, but it allows you to enter in your zip code, your address, your city, your, your, your province where you live, and it will give you some of the history of that land, what treaties were signed there, what languages were spoken, and what people are traditional to those lands. And it's a great resource to begin your research. It's not the final authority, but it's a great place to begin your research to find out whose land you're living on. Um, uh, anywhere around, it's most, of, it's most accurate around North America, but I think they're expanding uh, where, where they're doing their research in. But um, that's native-land.ca. Are we ready to go now into the discussion of the book or is there, is there something else yeah, we want to go by, before? By, we, okay. By all means. Yeah, please. Please. Okay, okay, I wasn't yeah. I went ahead and put the link for that in the chat if anybody wants it. Thank you. Okay. And I'm also going to share in, in the chat here, um, if you would like to buy a signed copy of the book, On Settling Truth, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery, those uh, can be actually purchased from my website. And I just put that into, my, into the chat as well. Um, and uh, you can get a signed copy there. So I want to talk a little bit about some of what the book is about, uh, the process of writing the book, my partnership with Sung Chan Ra, who was a fantastic, is a fantastic co-author of this book, and then talk about some of the content. Specifically, there's three sections I really want to highlight for you um, in this book. Um, first of all, for those of you who are not aware, the doctrine of discovery, it's a series of papal bulls, edicts of the Catholic Church, written between 1452 and 1493. It says things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. The doctrine of discovery is essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and their land is yours to take. So this is literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa colonize the continent and enslave the people because they did not believe African people to be human. It's the same doctrine that allowed Columbus, who was honestly lost at sea, to land in this new world, which was already inhabited by millions and claimed to have discovered it. As the first sentence of chapter one states, you cannot discover lands already inhabited. You can steal those lands, you can conquer those lands, you can colonize those lands, you can't discover them unless your worldview informs you that the people who are already living there are not fully human. So the doctrine of discovery is literally a white supremacist Christian doctrine. And that's the fruit, I would argue, and we actually argue in the book, that's the fruit of a church that has prostituted itself out to the empire. So that's a very brief summary of the doctrine of discovery. And the challenge with this doctrine is it gets embedded into the foundations of our nation. So our Declaration of Independence, which begins with this great um, understanding of we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal. If you read just uh, down to the entire document, um, you'll see that 30 lines later, this same document refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. <laughs> our Declaration of Independence, which begins with this inclusive term, we the people. Um, just a few lines later, Article 1, Section 2, the section of our Constitution that defines who is and who is not included in this document, who is, who is and who is not covered by this Constitution. It never mentions women, specifically excludes natives, and counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. In 1787, that literally leaves white men. And technically, it was white landowning men who could vote. <laughs> In 1823, there was a case before the Supreme Court. It's called Johnson versus McIntosh. It's two men of European descent. They were litigating over a single piece of land. 
One of them acquired the land from a native tribe. The other one said they acquired the same land from the government, and they want to know who owned it. Who had the right to sell the land, the tribe or the government, the U.S. government? The case, goes all, the case goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and this is the John Marshall Court, and they have to decide the principle that land titles are based on. They rule the principle is that discovery is what gives title to the land. And then they go on to reference the doctrine of discovery and state that even though natives were here first, but because we are savages, just like the Declaration of Independence identifies us, we only have the right of occupancy to the land. And Europeans have the, the right of discovery to the land, so they have the fee title, so they are the true title holders. That case in 1823, along with a few others, creates the legal precedent for land titles. That precedent and the doctrine of discovery are referenced by name by the Supreme Court in 1954, 1985, and most recently in 2005. I actually have a TEDx talk online, which I'll put this into the chat here on, um, on uh, the Zoom call, and you can share it out on YouTube if you want. But I did a TEDx talk about a year and a half ago, two years ago, called We the People, the Three Most Misunderstood Words in U.S. History. And I go through that 2005 court case, identifying and actually demonstrating it is probably one of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions written in my lifetime. And it was written and delivered by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now that shocks people, right? Because Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a voice of dissent on a very conservative Supreme Court who was fighting for the rights of the marginalized. And yes, she was. The problem is, when your land titles are based on the legal understanding that natives are savages, white supremacy suddenly becomes a bipartisan value. And so this is why even though Justice Ginsburg, yes, she advocated for the marginalized, but when it came to land titles, she had to side with the white supremacist understanding of the doctrine of discovery and the way it's been embedded legally into all the foundations of our nation, because had they not declared that, that would have thrown everybody's land titles into disarray. Which they so are, this right? Is <laughs> a huge challenge of what we need to do. So this, um, this doctrine of discovery is a very, very foundational level document that it's, not referenced in our constitution or in by name in our constitution or in our um doctors independence but the the impacts of it are definitely there and it is referenced by name in our supreme court opinion and so one of the things that i set out to do along with my co-author sing chan ra in this book is to help people understand what the doctrine of discovery is and to understand how deeply it has infected not only the history of this of our nation, but actually our day-to-day -day life going on even in, in 2020 and in 2021. I want to talk a little bit about my, my experience with my co-author. So Sing Chan Ra, if you have not heard of him before or read him, he is a fantastic um, author. He was uh, working, uh, teaching at North Park Seminary for a long time. He just moved this summer to Fuller Seminary, and he's now teaching at Fuller Seminary in Southern California. And one of his books that he's well known for, he wrote a book called The Next Evangelicalism, which is a fairly well-known book. And he also published this book, which is called uh, A Prophetic Lament, which is a very close look at the Book of Lamentations. And in fact, it was about maybe 10 years ago when Sung Chan and I, he was actually promoting, he was finishing up his book and beginning to promote it, talking a lot about lament. And I was traveling the country, speaking about the doctrine of discovery and actually calling the church into a space of lament. And for about a year, year and a half, we crossed paths at many different organizations and conferences. We heard each other's speeches numerous times, and we became friends during this through some other partnerships we had that we were involved in. And uh, he, was, he was calling out how anemic Western Christianity and the American church is at lament. And I was laying out the doctrine of discovery and calling the church into a process of lament. And we realized that there was a lot of overlap from what we were teaching. 
And so we decided to write this book together on the doctrine of discovery. And initially, we, we, we first decided to write the book. It was back maybe in 2015 when we signed a contract with InterVarsity Press to write the book. And uh, we thought the book would be primarily a call for the church to lament. That's what we were, we were the, kind of the thesis of our book. However, after the 2016 election, where the white evangelical church put someone into office who was explicitly racist and sexist and white supremacist, and the Democrats were arguing and, and, and the, the, are the, the, the liberal church was voting and advocating for someone who was implicitly racist and white supremacist. We decided we needed to change our book from a call to lament into just a flat out rebuke of the church. And so we sat down and kind of rewrote the entire thesis of the book. We rearranged some different sections and we began to, to just make, turn the book, transform the book into a flat out rebuke of the church. So there, there are three sections that are really kind of very crucial in the entire process of the book. And um, one of the decisions that we made early, and actually Sing Chan was a very big advocate for this, is he wanted my voice and my story to be very central in this book. Um, he wanted me to be able to tell sort of my story growing up, the story of my own family, my grandparents, um, my father, and just my own history. And so he he really empowered me to, to use this book to center some of my story and my voice. And then he provided very much a very needed and beneficial um, kind of and a compliment to it, where he did a lot of background research and he brought in a lot of his own research regarding um, the history of the church with the African American community and with slavery and um, his, all his work on lament and coming out of the next evangelicalism. And so there's a lot of places in the book where my voice is very much front and center. There's also several spaces where his voice is very front and center, and those are very crucial as well. But the, the two sections I wanted to, or the three sections I wanted to highlight today, the first is chapters three and four. And chapters three and four, especially for Christian audiences, are very important because they describe how the church got from the teachings of Jesus to this dehumanizing doctrine of discovery. How did the church make that journey from, from Jesus, who said things like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? How did they get from there to a church doctrine that literally said you can kill people who don't look like, sound like, act like, or worship like you do. And so those two chapters are really important um, because they help understand sort of what's going on at a theological level within the church. I'll lay out a few points of this for you today, but obviously we go much more in depth to this in the church. So when you look at Jesus' ministry, when Jesus came into this world, and his story that was recorded in the Gospels, he came to a group of people, the Israelites, who had a legacy of a land covenant with the God of Abraham. Their land covenant kind of gave them a barometer, if you will, of prosperity. The people of Israel generally knew that they were doing well in their relationship with their God if they were prosperous. If their borders were strong, if their military was strong, if their, if they, their economy and their, their, their livestock were, were healthy and their families were strong, they could know that they were doing things well in their relationship with God. If they were in exile, if their borders were porous, if they were um, removed from their promised lands, then that was a clue that they were somehow out of sorts with their relationship with God. And so it wasn't their only barometer, but one of their barometers of their relationship with God was their prosperity. And Jesus began to change that, even in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said to the people as he was teaching, blessed are you not when you prosper, but when you are persecuted. And he came and taught them, and this, you see this in Mark 8, you see this in other, in other passages around the Gospels, where Jesus told them that the Messiah, the Son of Man, the Christ, 
was going to be persecuted and even crucified. That did not fit at all with the spiritual lens of the disciples. And it was Peter who flat out said to Jesus, you don't have to die. And Jesus rebuked him and said, get behind me, Satan. You're not on the side of God, but of men. And even if you look at just at the Gospel of Mark, the whole second half of the book of Mark, chapters 8 through 16, is Jesus literally kind of debating back and forth with his disciples about the role of the Messiah. And it wasn't until Pentecost, after Jesus had died alone, risen from the dead, and appeared to his disciples, gone back into heaven, and then sent his Holy Spirit, that the disciples finally bought into this barometer of suffering this barometer of persecution. And as a result of buying into that, almost all of the disciples went on to die a martyr's death. Also, throughout his entire ministry, Jesus was adamant. He did not come to create a worldly empire. He frequently said, my kingdom is somewhere else. He was offered by Satan and by the people to be made king of this world if he wanted it, and he walked away every time. He was very adamant his kingdom was not of this earth. It was somewhere else. Now, when we started writing this book, I actually blamed the, what I would call the heresy of Christendom, the heresy of Christian empire, on Constantine. He was the one who converted, the emperor who converted to Christianity. He is the one who moved the capital. He is the one who Christianized Rome and created this Christian empire. But as we were preparing to write this book, and we want to actually include the story of Constantine's vision at Melvin Bridge. And as I was researching that story and the telling of that story, and it's actually recorded by Eusebius, who was uh, uh, the bishop of Caesarea, around the early fourth century, I found, I found something very interesting, which was, it was actually Eusebius who in his book, Ecclesiastical History, which is a volume of 11 books of the history of the church, really going from Jesus to the fourth century. And he was trying to record the history of the church. And in the first several books, maybe books one through five, one through seven, he's establishing the divinity of Christ, and he's actually holding up the martyrs as heroes of the faith, people who are sharing in the suffering of Christ. Between books eight and nine, he inserts a book called um, The Book of the Martyrs, where he talks about the great persecution which took place in the early fourth century, one of the, great, the worst persecutions in the history of the church. And he identifies that not only did he know many of the people who were martyred personally, but he saw some of their deaths himself. The persecution touched him. After book eight, beginning in book eight and going past book eight through the rest of the book, his attitude towards martyrdom shifts. And instead of focusing on the piety of the martyrs, he begins focusing on the emperors and what they can do to end the persecution. It's there where he begins propping up Constantine as a God-ordained emperor of Rome. And if you read the last chapter of the last book of his understanding of ecclesiastical history, and I argue that if you're writing a book called Ecclesiastical History, technically your book would not have a conclusion because if you're really writing about the history of the church, well, that church will not conclude until the bridegroom of the church returns by the fact that you're writing the book is evidence that that hasn't happened yet. So you're merely writing a, a preface or an early chapter in this very long saga. But if you read the last chapter of the last book of his understanding of ecclesiastical history, you see he actually has a conclusion. And his conclusion is the salvation that comes to Rome, not through Christ, but through Constantine. You see, if you want to go from a barometer of suffering back to a barometer of prosperity, if you want to establish a heretical entity known as a Christian empire, your biggest obstacle is Christ. 
And so if you want to establish that heresy, the first thing you have to do is remove Christ from ecclesiastical history, which is exactly what Eusebius sets out to do. And so his book literally writes Christ out of ecclesiastical history. And then his next book, The Life of the Blessed Emperor Constantine, is just flat out heresy. Just flat out heresy, propping up Constantine as the God ordained savior. And then, of course, we have the theologians of the day. Will they, will they prophesy to this heresy or will they collude with it? In our book, we look very closely at both Augustine and Aquinas who both decide very clearly to collude with the heresy of Christendom rather than to speak truth and to prophesy to it. And so that is part of the journey of how we get from these teachings of Jesus to a doctrine of discovery that allows you to kill people who don't worship like, look like, speak like, or act like you do. It's because the church sheds, rejects, the call of the church to suffer given by Christ, the call of the church to live for something beyond what's on this earth, and instead it embraces this prosperity of this barometer of prosperity, and it seeks to establish a worldly empire. So that, those two chapters, chapters three and four, are very, very important to understanding kind of how this gets embedded in the foundations of the nation. The two chapters that were the hardest to write in this book are chapters nine and 10. Chapters nine and 10 look very closely at the legacy, I would actually call it the mythological legacy of Abraham Lincoln. I won't, I won't, won't give away too much of the book here, but I'll, I'll tell you how we kind of got into this whole section. We, I was writing a section of the book. We were in the middle of writing the book, and I was writing a section on white supremacy. And I was looking for a good way to conclude that section. I've been working on it for about maybe two or three months. And if you've ever traveled to Washington, D.C., one of the most magnificent memorials or monuments we have here is the Lincoln Memorial. It's actually modeled after a temple in Greece. It's one of the grandest memorials in this entire city. And if you go to that memorial, at the base of the memorial, there's a small museum. Most people don't even see it. But if you're looking for the bathroom, it's right near the bathroom. And so a lot of people will see it. It's at the base of the memorial. Um, it's it's a, a, about the size of a large classroom. And if you go into that memorial, into that museum, you will find there are plaques hanging at the wall. These are like five, maybe, maybe three to four feet tall, about two and a half to three feet wide. There, there are these large plaques, and they have etched in them different quotes by Abraham Lincoln from different parts of his legacy. And on one of those walls, there's a series of five plaques, and it, it's talking about his, his words and his thoughts about the union. And in the center of that wall, it has this quote. It says, I would save the union. My primary object in this struggle, wrote Abraham Lincoln, is not to save or destroy slavery, is to preserve the union. If I could save the union without freeing a single slave, I would do it. If I could save by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. There's a quote hanging at the Lincoln Memorial that literally states, According to Abraham Lincoln, black lives don't matter. I've actually stood there by that plaque on President's Day, and I've watched people file past it. And they'll read it, and they'll kind of nod their head, and then they'll move on because it's Abraham Lincoln, right? Everything he says is great and wonderful. And there was, I remember one time there was this African-American family who were walking right in front of me, and they were reading that plaque. And I said, as they started to move on, I said, excuse me, did you read that plaque? And they said, yes. I said, do you see that Lincoln is saying that black lives don't matter? He looked at me like I was crazy. He went, looked back at the plaque. He read it. His eyes got wide. He, looked, he took out his phone. He took a picture. I can't believe it. 
couldn't believe it. And so I wanted to include the story of this plaque into the last section of this chapter on white supremacy to help us understand how even Lincoln had this mentality that said, black lives don't matter. That, that's how implicit that racial bias is. So I woke up one morning and I had about two, an hour and a half before I had to bring my daughters to school. And I was going to write this story into my book. I had, I had spoken on this. I knew the facts. I knew everything about it. So I, it would take me an hour maybe to write it into the book. So I woke up and I thought, before I wrote it in, I thought, well, I should probably include some of the context from it. And the Lincoln's quote on that plaque comes as his response to an op-ed written by, um, uh, um, uh, I forget his name now, Douglas, who was the editor of the New York Tribune. And uh, he had written an op-ed calling for the immediate emancipation of the slaves. And so I thought, well, I should probably read his op-ed. So I read his op-ed. His op-ed quoted something um, that, Lincoln, that, that Abraham Lincoln said in, in his inauguration. And so I thought, well, I should read that section of the inauguration. So I read his inauguration speech. And in that speech, that section he quoted, Abraham Lincoln was quoting something he said in the Lincoln-Douglas debate. Now, I've heard about the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but I've never read them. And so I thought, okay, I, I should go back and look at the Lincoln-Douglas debates, kind of with fear and trembling, because I didn't know what I was going to find. And so I looked at what he was referencing, and I found this quote by Abraham Lincoln, who was introducing himself in one of the early debates. Most people knew that he was against chattel slavery, but they did not know where he stood on race. And so in his speech, in one of the early debates, he said, um, I have no intention of abolishing slavery. I have no intention of freeing the slaves in states where slavery already exists. I have no intention of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor allowing them to hold office, nor to intermarry. He said there's a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever for, for, um, forbid the two from ever living in terms of political and social equality. But as long as they must remain together, there has to be the distinction between superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, said Abraham Lincoln, believe in the, superior, in the superiority of the white race. I couldn't believe it. Abraham Lincoln was a blatant white supremacist, unapologetically. I turned off my computer right there. I couldn't write that morning. I had to digest the fact that not only did Abraham Lincoln have an implicit racial bias, he had an explicit and absolutely white supremacist mentality that not only appeared in the Lincoln Douglas debate, but also appeared in his inauguration speech. And I didn't know how to think process through that and that began probably about a four month journey of me looking very in depth at the legacy of abraham lincoln's speeches all the way through his entire life his entire political career including his final legacy his last piece which was the 13th amendment right most people believe the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. It doesn't. What it states is it says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereas the party has been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States. Abraham Lincoln and the 13th Amendment does not abolish slavery. It redefines and codifies enslavement under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. A criminal justice system, Abraham Lincoln said very clearly in the Lincoln-Douglas debates that black people would never play a part in. He would never have voters or jurors or judges of Negroes. And then on top of that, so it was a few weeks later, a few months later, and I was asked to give a speech here in Washington, D.C., a short speech on President's Day. And I wanted to deconstruct Lincoln. It was actually, I was invited by the, the Poor People's Campaign to speak here in Washington, D.C. I had two minutes. 
And I thought, well, if I have two minutes on President's Day, I'm going to deconstruct Abraham Lincoln's legacy. And that morning, I was sitting here in, in my house. I wasn't studying anything. I wasn't learning anything. I wasn't researching anything. I was merely pondering what I was going to say that night. Now, one of the worst atrocities in the history of our Navajo people, my people, is the long walk. When Kit Carson went through our lands and rounded us up and marched us down to Bosque Redondo and put us into a, what can only be described as a death camp, 10,000 of our people were moved there beginning in 1863 to 1865. And a quarter of our people died while they were in prison in this death camp. It's called the Long Walk. It's very much like the, the Trail of Tears for the Cherokee, the Choctaw, and the Chickasaw. And as I was sitting there this, that morning, pondering what I was going to say, all my life, when I thought of the Long Walk, the Army Captain Kit Carson, who was the one who went through and killed our people, I've always blamed him for the Long Walk. But that morning, I realized the Long Walk was a part of Abraham Lincoln's Indian policies. Not only that, which was in 1863, but the removal of the Dakota people and the Winnebago from Minnesota in 1863 as well, the, the Cheyenne and Arapaho and the massacre at Sand Creek in 1864 in Colorado. And I realized that not only was Abraham Lincoln a blatant white supremacist, but between 1862 and 1865, when he died, he literally was ethnic cleansing the states of Minnesota, Colorado, and the territory of New Mexico to make way for the Transcontinental Railway. And so this chapter, these two chapters, chapters nine and 10, go through that history and they deconstruct the mythological legacy of Abraham Lincoln. And the challenge, the hardest part about writing that chapter was not finding the white supremacist statements and the ethnic cleansing policies of Abraham Lincoln. Those were easy. What was challenging was how do we present this in a way so people won't throw the book down and walk out of the room? And so one of the things that we start that chapter with, I won't give you the whole piece, but we, we, history was written by the victors. So imagine if Nazi Germany had won World War II, how would their history books have recorded the Holocaust? Well, we have Holocaust deniers today. Imagine if they won the war, what Holocaust? There was no Holocaust. How would their his historians have recorded the legacy of Adolf Hitler? Had they won World War II? Well, he would be their greatest fear ever, right? History is written by the victors. And one of the challenges we have in the United States is we've never lost a war that matters. We've never had to have a regime change. We've never been disarmed. We've never lost land. At least not on our mainland. We've never had to endure the scorn of the global community for our atrocities. Because we've never lost our, a war that matters, we've written our own history for 250 years. And so we did to Abraham Lincoln exactly what you could imagine Nazi Germany would have done to Adolf Hitler had they won their wars. And so those two chapters, I've been told by numerous people, are two of the hardest chapters to read, but they're two of the chapters people are most thankful for because they leave your eyes wide open into how we don't teach an accurate history. We don't teach a full understanding of who we are, what we've done, and what we're standing on. The other chapter that is really important in here I think it's chapter 11, where we talk about trauma. In the work that I've done, as I've been working in, this, in these issues for decades, I've been very aware of the impact trauma has on people. I share some of my own story of an accident I was involved in when I was in high school, 
that gave me some PTSD. And it was an accident where I was the driver of the car. And my after in, in the accident, my brother died. And I had to wrestle with not only the, the trauma of the accident, which I survived, but the fact that this accident caused the death of my brother. I've also been very aware of how trauma has effect, effect, affected communities of color. So I, we look at PTSD, post-traumatic stress, or a post-traumatic stress disorder. It's, it's a, a response, an individual response to a horrifying event. It affects you mentally, physically, emotionally, relationally. It's kind of this all-encompassing condition. But it, it, PTSD is a single diagnosis for an individual person, usually in response to a single tragic event. Now, there's another trauma called complex PTSD, which comes not from a single event, but from a series of events. So if you can get PTSD from being, in, from being assaulted, you can get complex PTSD from living in an abusive relationship. If you can get PTSD from being in a battle, you can get complex PTSD from living in a war zone. And the site community has identified, they've observed that complex PTSD can be passed down from one generation to the next. There's not a full understanding of how that happens, but they see the symptoms of a complex PTSD in the children and grandchildren of the people who experienced it. And then of course, there's another trauma, which is called historical trauma, which doesn't affect, uh, affect affect a single person, it affects a larger community. It's how psychologists understand the dissatisfaction in a broader community. It was first identified in the native community in response to boarding schools. You can also see symptoms of it in African American communities after um, segregation or Jim Crow or even enslavement. You can see it in, in Jewish communities after the Holocaust. You can see it in Japanese American communities after the internment camps. I would actually refer to, and in this book, I, I understand, I refer to historical trauma as a multi-generational communal manifestation of a complex PTSD. And by understanding these traumas, PTSD, complex PTSD, and historical trauma, I can actually prepare myself better to engage these dialogues within communities of color. If I'm aware of the trauma that the, the community is dealing with, I can prepare my work, my presentation, I can be prepared for what I may say or not say and how that might trigger or elicit a response from my audience. And so by being aware of these traumas and these traumatic responses, I can actually make sure that we, we are able to, to, to do the work we're trying to do. But if you've done any sort of work in racial, race issues around our country, you know that the group that is most likely to obstruct your dialogues on race is not communities of color, but it's white people. And in this chapter, we actually look at a, a diagnosis identified by Rachel McNair called PITS, which is a perpetration-induced traumatic stress. She, she observes that, that, P, that PITS is like PTSD in almost every way, except if PTSD afflicts the victims of a horrifying event, PITS would afflict the perpetrator, the person who caused it. She actually calls it the psychology of killing. And if, if, if you have a quote unquote license to kill, because of your job, you're in the military, you're in, in a police force, you have something that gives you a license in a certain environment, in a certain context to take a life. What does that do to you psychologically? She takes a very close look at a very comprehensive study of Vietnam vets. She also looks at this quote by Socrates, who says the doer of injustice is more miserable than the sufferer. And she identifies that it causes a perpetration-induced traumatic stress. So then I hypothesize that if PTSD has a multi-generational communal manifestation at a complex level that we see afflicting communities of color through historical trauma, would it not make sense that PITS would also have a multi-generational communal manifestation at a complex level that is what is afflicting white America? 
And so I actually interact with white Americans as another group of traumatized people. And I found that by preparing for white audiences as another group of traumatized people, it actually allows me to not have my work be derailed by the objections and the things they will throw up. Now, I have to be very clear, white people are not victims of trauma. This is a perpetration-induced traumatic stress. But they still respond to it like you would to any other trauma. Again, the first symptom of trauma is shock and denial. And so in that chapter 11, we actually go into both my own story as well as my observations of what I see going on around the country and some of the advantages and benefits that I would say are there when you understand that not only has this history, this dehumanizing, ethnic cleansing, enslaving history had a profound effect upon people of color, it's actually had a very profound effect upon the white majority who are not victims of this trauma, but are standing on top of it. One of the conclusions of the book is I, I use this quote by George Erasmus, who was a Diné elder. It's actually not his quote, it's a quote he used when he was writing about um, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that took place in Canada in their response to residential schools. And his, the quote he, he used said, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build community, he said, you have to start by creating a common memory. I love that quote because I think it gets to the heart of our nation's problem with race, which is we do not have a common memory. We have a white majority that remembers this mythological history of, of um, discovery, exceptionalism, and expansion. We also have communities of color that have the lived experience of broken lands, of broken trees and stolen lands, of enslavement and Jim Crow laws, of segregation, of mass incarceration, of internment camps, of families being ripped apart at our borders, and there's no common memory. And if we're honest, there's actually no point in U.S. history where we can look back and say, oh, during this period, we had healthy relationships across racial lines. It doesn't exist. One of the things that I, I, we say, I say in this book, and I've been saying this actually even before we wrote the book, is the United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. It's a conversation I would put on par with the truth and the reconciliation commissions that happened in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. However, I would not call ours truth and reconciliation because reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony, which isn't accurate. Race is a human construct. It's not a genetic difference. And in the West, race was constructed here in the U.S. And so to use the term racial reconciliation is a misnomer because race was constructed for the express purpose of oppressing and dividing. So racial reconciliation doesn't make sense. I would instead use the term racial conciliation. If reconciliation says there was a previous harmony, conciliation is merely about mediating a dispute. So let's just be honest. We don't need racial reconciliation. We need racial conciliation. So we don't need a, a truth and reconciliation commission. We need a truth and conciliation commission. And I'm so convinced we need one sooner rather than later. I actually ran for president in 2020, and that was one of the signature planks of my platform was to establish this national dialogue on race, gender, and class, this truth and conciliation commission. There is a lot of work that we have to do. And as I thought about this, even beyond just the scope of our nation, right? I know there's a lot of people from around the world listening to this. Let's think for a moment, right? About one of the strongest alliances the US has internationally. It's NATO, right? How many of our NATO partners 
are also colonial nations. France, Germany, the UK, Netherlands, most of Europe at one point was colonial to the rest of the world. If we need to create a common memory to deal with our own domestic policies here in the United States, how much more do we need to create a common memory to deal with our foreign policies? I just tweeted this yesterday. I said, if foreign policy, your foreign policy requires you to be the most financially wealthy and the most militarily strong nation of everyone else, the more accurate term for that is imperialism. And how much of our foreign policy of the West is about we just have to be dominant we have to be superior, we have to be the strongest, we have to be the greatest. That's not a foreign policy, that's imperialism. And so I think just like we need to have this national dialogue on race, gender, and class domestically, we also need to create this common memory and ask the very hard questions of what is it that actually aligns us with most of our allies? And is it our colonial values? And do we instead need to find different values that we can base our relationships on instead of our shared colonial history and our shared colonial dominance? So there's, there's a lot of things we have to discuss about. And we wrote this book with the hope of starting a dialogue. The book is centered on the church. The book is a flat out rebuke of the church. But it was written in a way, I hope, that allows this rebuke and this dialogue to take place in a public sphere. And I think the church, not only does the church need to be rebuked, it needs to be rebuked publicly. And as I tell people when I lecture, right, it doesn't actually matter what your faith tradition is. If you live here in the United States, if you own land or someday hope to own land, if you do not have a treaty with the indigenous inhabitants of the people whose land you're living on, The only basis you have for being here is this dehumanizing doctrine of discovery. That's it. The U.S. has over 400 treaties with Native nations. None of them were kept. So the only legal standing the U.S. has for its continued presence in North America is a theological doctrine that came out of the heresy of Christian empire that dehumanizes anyone who's not white, European, Christian, and male, to be honest. So this is why I, I, I want this rebuke to be public, not private. This originated within the church, but it doesn't matter if you came across on the Mayflower or if you entered this country last week. If you don't have a treaty with the indigenous peoples of these lands, you are reliant upon this doctrine of discovery to justify your presence here. And that's a conversation we have to have. And that's what I'm trying to do with this book. And that's the purpose of this dialogue. I want to create this common memory, not to divide us, not to shame people, not to tear people down. I want to create this common memory so that for the very first time, we can have a healthier community. Thank you for allowing me to share with you a bit today. I know I didn't go near in depth as we could have, but um, hopefully that'll encourage you to buy the book. And uh, it's On Selling Truth, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. 
and uh, I would be happy to take some questions or to, to have some dialogue now about what we've discussed. Oh man, Mark, this has been really powerful to hear you talk about this. You are so um, eloquent and you're, you're saying things that we have been needing to hear you know, for generations. Uh, it strikes me, first of all, that there's a real parallel here with the whole business of capitalism, which is all about profits. And profits doesn't have to do with human beings. It has to do with materialist, materialist values like you're talking about. And so it's, it seems to me that it's really hard uh, to kind of uh, comb out the differences between these, uh, these issues. For instance, here I am, a, I'm a, a very devout Christian and I'm totally aware of this, this history all since the very beginning, since the beginning of the Christian church. There's been this, this fight between the two, um, the two ends of the spectrum, one being power and one being love. And it seems to me as though it's kind of like one end of the spectrum takes the cross by the bottom and talks about love and sacrifice, and the other one takes it by the top and turns it into a sword. And that's what we're talking about here, that, that the manifest destiny idea is taking the cross as a sword and just uh, wiping out human beings for the sake of power. And so the, the church is implicated exactly as you say, you know, uh, the whole religion of Christianity is based on Christ and Christ always talked about love and, and acceptance and loving your enemies and, uh, you know, blessed are the persecuted. And it's the, it's the official church that turned that message into power. And we still have not solved that even despite the, um, Um, Martin Luther and the, uh, the many kinds of, of um, revolts kind of within the church itself. And we're, we're still carrying on this same fight between the, the, you could say the conservative church and the uh, liberal church. And we see the same split in politics and in um, economics. Um, I just think it's wonderful that, that you have delivered this story in such a way that it's much easier to be able to, to separate these different things. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, obviously, this is not going to be resolved from the top down. There is no institution in the world that is going to suddenly say, oh, we need to take responsibility for our own actions. It's going to come from the bottom up. So as, as um, frustrated human beings, I wonder if you can give us just a few tips of how we can come to this point of conciliation. Like, for instance, I own land that was stolen from the Little Shell people. And at the end of the, your book, you say, what we need to do is have a kind of conversation about giving the land back to the people who occupied it originally. <laughs> now, this is a pretty astonishing idea, but I've been thinking about it since I read the book and I think, how can I contact the Little Shell people and say, can I make a treaty with you that recognizes the fact that this land was where your ancestors came from, not mine. And so how can we move forward? I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> yeah, so there's a lot of challenges in the midst of this. And while I, I think one of the ways I would phrase it is you said earlier that we're never gonna change it at the top. So this has to be from the bottom up. And I would, and this is after spending years and years pondering this, I would actually respectfully disagree with that. I think the problem is, is we have to change it from the top. That's why I ran for president in 2020, because you don't have the power to write a treaty with another native nation. You're, you're an individual. You can build a relationship, but you can't make a treaty with them and you can't affect policy with them. 
So even let's talk about the challenge of returning land, and that's something that's happening more frequently. The challenge with that is, based on the doctrine of discovery, Native nations don't own land. Our reservations are trust lands. They're lands held in trust by the federal government. This is one of the things that makes economic development so challenging on reservations is because the nations don't own those lands, they're trust lands. And so even if you gave it back to the tribe, which you could do, it would go back into their trust lands, which again states that ultimately the federal government is the holder of that title and not the native nation. And so this is why, again, one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing the work I'm trying to do is we have to deal with land titles. When I ran my campaign in 2020, I said my goal was to build a nation where for the very first time, we the people truly means all the people. And that will not happen until we deal with land titles. Because right now, the way land titles are legally constructed in the United States of America, natives have to be understood as savages, people who cannot hold title to land, not individually, but tribal-wise, our, our, our native nations. And until we deal with that, we're not going to be able to fix this problem. Now, I would say the challenge with that is, right, as you pointed out, that makes this process overwhelming. How do we deal with these structures from the top down? How do we deal, or even if the bottom up, the bottom is our foundations, not the people, it's our foundations. How do we deal with it at that level? Something I've been teaching on for a number of years, and we almost use this as the conclusion of our book, but we didn't. But frequently I get asked to preach in churches. And when I do, usually they'll bring me in and I'll come in on like a Friday or Saturday and I'll do a presentation on the doctrine of discovery and maybe some workshops. And then I'll, I'll preach a sermon on Sunday. What I normally do in those instances is I will give all of my content on the doctrine of discovery on the Saturday sessions and lay out how massive and foundational and overwhelming these problems are. And then on Sunday, I'll preach this sermon, which I'm gonna put into the chat right now. It's titled, The Biblical Dynamics of Power and Authority. So we live in a world that is obsessed with power. Power is the ability to act. You have muscles so you can lift something up. You have money so you can purchase something. You have weapons so you can destroy something. Power gives you the ability to act. Authority is the right of jurisdiction, the permission to act. Now, the United States of America, and I would argue the American church, has a ton of power. But we have very little authority. If the U.S. loses its nuclear arsenal and goes bankrupt, name five countries that give a crap what we say, right? Why do we get our way around the world? Well, because we're the only country in the world that's dropped nuclear bombs and killed hundreds of thousands of civilians. We flaunt our money everywhere. We have a ton of power, it's how we, it's how we act. We have almost no authority. Now, because the church has this same lens, right, it's this heresy of Christendom, the church is just as obsessed with power as the nation is. And they'll often point to Jesus and say, look, Jesus had all this power. Well, if you read the Gospels closely, actually, Jesus did very little through his power. Most of what he did was his authority. When he came into the synagogue in Acts are in Mark chapter one, he began teaching. And he didn't teach like the scribes and the Pharisees who said, you know, according to a rabbi, so-and-so, let me tell you this, our school, such and such, let me tell you this. Jesus came in and he taught as one who had authority. 
he would say things like, well, you heard this was said, but let me tell you what we were thinking when we wrote that down. Jesus didn't talk like someone who studied scripture. He talked like someone who wrote it. And that freaked people out. When he was confronted with an unclean spirit in the same synagogue, he spoke to the spirit with authority and it listened to him. And the people were amazed and said, what is this a new teaching with authority? When he's on the boat with his disciples and he's taking a nap from a long day and a squall comes up and waves are coming into the boat and his disciples who are experienced fishermen, they come to Jesus and they weren't afraid. They've been in this situation before. They know what you do and what you don't do. What you do is you bail out water. What you don't do is take a nap. I don't care who your daddy is. So they come to Jesus and say, what are you doing? Don't you care if we drown? Grab a bucket. Jesus wakes up, assesses the situation. He doesn't grab a bucket. He speaks to the wind. He addresses the waves. And they listen to him. Then it says the disciples were terrified and said, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him, right? For power to be effective, you have to demonstrate it. We've demonstrated our willingness to drop nuclear bombs. We've demonstrated our willingness to spend our money. And so people listen to us. Authority doesn't require demonstration. It's inherent. You have it or you don't. Jesus most often tried to hide his miracles. He goes up to Jairus' house. Or no, he goes up to Jairus' house. His daughter has died. He's a well-known man. He's wealthy. So there's professional mourners making a fuss outside. Jesus walks up and he says, oh, she's not dead. She's asleep. The people laugh at him. You're an idiot. He goes in raises the girl from the dead, feeds her, and then tells the parents and Peter, James, and John who are with him, Shh, don't tell anybody. So five minutes later, when they walk out with the girl, what do people think? So, so Did he raise Mark, her from the Mark, dead? I, I'd like to ask you a question here. What does, they, look, what does a solution look like? To what well, so this is, this is what I'm getting at, is we are trying to address these problems through power. And I promise you, you will never raise up enough money. You will never get enough money. You will never have enough weapons. This thing is too deeply ensconced. You will never deal with it through power. If we want to make this change... Well, what, it, what we is to the change? It what is the change? Through authority. What is the change? The change is we have, to, we have to change the structures, even the foundations of these nations, of this church that has been obsessed with power, but does not understand, I would argue, authority. Well, you're referring to church, but you're not referring to what church? And I know my Dutch ancestors came here because of church driving us out of Netherlands, okay, and, and, uh, and so, so I, you know, I, I think we have to be more specific about church. The CRC, which is a Dutch denomination, yeah. established a mission in the Southwest in the early 1900s mm -hmm. for 75 to 80 years, they ran a boarding school. They took children, native children, from their homes. They put them into a military-style boarding school. They punished them for speaking their languages. They punished them for practicing their culture. Their goal was to kill the Indian to save the man. They even named their mission Rehoboth, which says, God has given us this place and we shall flourish in this land from Genesis. God didn't give him that land. Abraham Lincoln ethnically cleansed it. Well, Mark, when I, I brought this up there, to the, there, when I brought this up to the CRC church, they rejected the doctrine of discovery. They said, yes, that's a heresy. And then they passed a resolution 
affirming their missionaries who established this boarding school and said they weren't doing the doctrine of discovery, they were doing the Great Commission. Okay, I mean, it's, it, 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 there's so much wrapped up in this because, uh, for example, there's a book called Island at the Center of the World, which is about the founding of um, New, New Amsterdam, okay, which was our, mm -hmm. Dutch, our Dutch heritage, right? And I don't remember a single mention in that book, um, which is based on all the Dutch original sources, I don't remember a single mention about the church, not a single one. Um, and I know that my ancestors went, you know, settled as far as Albany and Rensselaer in New York state. They also settled Manhattan and, and Brooklyn, but to a large part, they lived in peace with the native tribes. Uh, when they were when they were in Rensselaerwick, which was up around uh, Albany, there were only twelve European settlers up there, and there were whole tribes of Mohawks and Oneidas and all those uh, native tribes. But they they stayed there, and they stayed there peacefully. Um, so I'm not, you know, when I. You know, when I was studying in law school, um, the guy who was the valedictorian of my class, who was a personal friend of my next door neighbor, uh, was very interested in, in the topic of the condition of the Native American tribes. And at that time, as far as I knew, and as far as we ever discussed it, um, he referred to those native tribes as uh, sovereign nations. And I still think of them that way, sovereigns. And I, I do recognize and agree that a lot of nasty things happen. I don't doubt that at all. But at the same time, um, I also know that, that there's, more than 110, I think, casinos that were created in the United States that are on tribal lands and they are, have their legal existence there because the tribe said, I want a casino. No matter what the state or the federal government of the US says, this is my sovereign land and I want to concede it, casino. And so the result of that has been uh, the Oneidas um, can send every child who wants to go to college to college at no cost. Um, now, for hundreds of years, maybe 200 years, the Oneidas lived in poverty and the Onondagas lived in poverty. I acknowledge that. Uh, but once this idea of we're sovereign, therefore we can do this, and they did it, uh, the result of that was a very successful thing for the tribes. And that's true internet, you know, across the whole country, there are, there are casinos. And so I'd like to know what you'd have me do or what you would have my children do. My, my children live in the Albany area still, okay, and that's an area that my Dutch settler, my Dutch heritage settled 400 years ago. Um, and I, I don't know what we should do based on your premise. Again, this is where I'm saying we need to have this national dialogue on race, gender, and class. People will throw around the term native nations are sovereign. That is not the case legally. Right. This is why pipelines still get built. This is why there's things happening in court. This is why 
um, the doctrine of discovery is being referenced as recently as 2005. Is, you know, I, I often tell people Native nations are sovereign over our lands, like your teenage child is sovereign over their bedroom. Um, yeah, they can put a sign on the door, but ultimately it's your house. And that's what the Doctrine of Discovery has stated. So there's, there, there's very much a, a, a parental child relationship between the U.S. government and Native nations. And um, that there is not a there's not an understanding of a, these are sovereign entities. It's being discussed more, but that's not the case, not legally, not jurisdictionally. Even if you have a casino, you need to have extensive compacts with both the state and the federal government to be able to operate those casinos. They do not have the ability just to do what they want with the land they're on. And they have casinos because they found some legal loopholes that allowed them to establish them. And so these are some of the, there's a lot of challenges now, a lot of nations, Native nations, will use their casinos to fund both educational programs as well as, uh, as, well as um, uh, uh, cultural preservation things, language preservation and other things like that, which is a good thing to do. Um, but casinos are by no means the solution. They're, they're one way that Native nations can begin to raise capital. Well, I'm not, I'm not Again, saying because they're, we don't so, own they're our a land. solution. And, and actually, I, I don't believe in gambling. But on the other hand, um, um, you yep. know, I, I think the, the story that you're telling is a story that is a story of animus that uh, doesn't really reflect the development of our species per se. Okay, in other words, if I, I ask you, how about, um, you know, what do you think about the Egyptian pharaohs taking over the, the Nile Delta? <laughs> okay, for example, I mean, hu hu human beings evolved out of Ald by Gorge, according to philanthropists or well, whatever the specialty is, anthropologists. And so, um, yes, there has been lots of blood and Dr. Carl Jung definitely talked about it every which way but loose. His, the Red Book is full of blood. Um, and you know, but I give you an example of of um, the uh, the black community seeking reparations for slavery. Well, my mm -hmm. my ancestors didn't have any slaves. They never had any slaves. They went and built small farms up in upstate New York. They they minded their own business, and they never never. Uh, were slaveholders and moreover, they fought against slavery in the civil war. So, so why is that my issue? Skip, I wonder if I could chime in here. All right, chime in, Miles, go ahead. Um, so uh, let me just quote, first of all, uh, Archbishop Fred Hiltz of the Anglican Church of Canada and in a documentary that the Anglican Church of Canada produced for the Primates Commission on Discovery, Reconciliation and Justice. This is what the Archbishop said. The doctrine of discovery is spiritual arrogance of the worst kind. Um, what I, I want to do is to bring this to Jung and uh, first of all, acknowledge that, that I am on the traditional territories of the Miyatsitapi, the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, what I think uh, I would ask or suggest Mark Charles to do is every time he uses white with, with white supremacy, white fragility, whatever, if uh, my suggestion would be that he state it that the, and it's the tool or the weapon of white supremacy, white fragility or whatever. And, and racism is always got to be put into context as being a tool or a weapon because my skin color and your skin color, Skip, 
is not the problem. It's uh, skin color is not an attitude. So there's, there, there's an attitude of arrogance on the part of this doctrine of discovery. And it supports those people who want to hoard and they, are, they benefit from conflict. The last thing they want sure. to see I mean, this is, is this what is Jung, the power devil that, that Dr. Jung talks about. Obviously, that's you're right. right. Jung, Jung was calling for harmony among these world religions and to drop those aspects that are arrogance. And I was just in southern Alberta, and I do suffer from uh, the condition that Mark was saying that. Um, people who are white have because I am injured. I'm injured because as Carl Jung said, the God image in me or the soul is not reflected by the way we've treated the indigenous people. And I just was down in writing on Stone Provincial Park and I picked up this book that I have yet to read, but it's Blackfoot Ways of Knowing. Ways of Knowing. I. I don't know the ways of knowing of the Blackfoot. I don't know the ways of knowing sufficiently of the Hebrew, the Jewish people. And that's what Carl Jung was about, that God is supra, internal in, the, in our God image. And we need to get to that. So I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, we've got a couple of other questions. I would, yeah, go, uh, go ahead. We, we have Tara there. It's Tara. Tara. Yes. Tara, why, why don't you ask your question? Um, your comment. I would like to ask you, Mark, where does does um, nature uh, come in your um, ideas about reconciliation? Um, it, it, it seems to me like very often when I get into these conversations, it's the religious aspects that and the kind of um, God kinds of things that um, get all the attention and um, in it, that my experience with, with the indigenous and the aboriginal world is that they are deeply attuned to the natural world. And it seems to me that many of our difficulties would uh, uh, resolve themselves if we shifted our perspective to uh, the planet as being absolutely fundamental to our existence. So could you, could you speak to that, yeah. please? Yeah, I begin the book, the introduction to the book with a story of when I moved back to our Navajo nation, we lived on our reservation for about 11 years. And I began to follow in the tradition of my elders and my ancestors before me of watching the sunrise. I would rise up every morning and for 11 years greeted the sunrise with my prayers. Um, and what I found, and I share this in the book, I won't go into depth on all of it. I found that as I watched it, not just day after day or week after week, but month after month and eventually year after year, it was profoundly humbling. And it reminded me how much I was not in control. Right? For all our technology, for all of our resources, for everything we have as a nation and as a people, we can't control the sunrise. We can't make it come faster. We can't make it come slower. We can't halt it, stop it, whatever. It happens. And along with that, the seasons and everything else. And when you look at a lot of Western culture, so much of Western culture is around the, the, the notion to maintain our being in control. And ultimately, I think people who live much more close, much closer to nature recognize that we're ultimately not in control. And you actually become at peace with that for most for people who are trying to maintain control, being out of control feels very disrupting or very terrifying. But as you become accustomed to that, you actually learn how to be at peace in the midst of this environment where you, you acknowledge, yeah, I can't control this. 
And I shared that story at the beginning of the book for a very important reason. Because if we're going to, so many of the challenges that we're facing come out of our desire to be in control of things and of other people. And there's not nearly as much recognition of the humility we have to have, not only before each other, but before nature and the environment. And <clears throat> so I, I think it, that is very important. And one of the challenges that you know, we see is much of Western culture is no longer indigenous to their land. They've lost their, their sense of being indigenous to, a, to a, a set of lands. And, you know, this creates a problem. One of, the, one, of the, one of the ways that I describe this is, um, I'm, I, there's so much I could go into, but we don't have a lot of time. Because most people, people who came from Europe, people who from the West have lost their sense of being indigenous to a set of lands. They're looking for a way to reclaim that, right? But they're not doing it properly. So they came here and they conquered and they, they stole. And now they're, they're carving faces of their genocidal presence into stolen mountains. They're renaming other mountains and they're, they're trying to create some connection to the land here, but they're not doing that through relationship and even through treaty with the people who were already inhabiting these lands. And so it's all based on what the power they have and you can't buy that type of, <laughs> that type of, of, of space, right? You can be given to it, you can, it can be given to you, but you, you can't buy it. So I'm gonna share a link in here. It's an article I wrote um, several, uh, a few years ago, and it's in regards to, um, I was asked when, when uh, they renamed Mount McKinley back to Denali. <laughs> and an organization here in the U.S. asked me to write about why this was significant for Native Americans for Mount Denali, for Mount McKinley to be renamed back to Denali. This was at the end of the Obama administration and uh, took place in Alaska. Now the article that I gave them was why this was so important to white people. Um, and it, it, again, it just, it reframes how we think about the land. One, I'll, let me share a brief metaphor with you for a moment. When I moved back to the Navajo Nation and we lived for three years in a very remote section of our reservation, we were on a dirt road, six miles off the nearest paved road. We lived in a one room Hogan with dirt wall, dirt floor and wooden walls, no running water, no electricity in our community. We moved there completely prepared to be off the grid, but we were shocked at how marginalized we felt. It literally felt like we dropped off the ends of the earth. During the same period, I'm learning, I'm experiencing this marginalization, I'm learning about the doctrine of discovery, and I'm trying to process through these emotions and these thoughts with my non-Native friends. We learned very quickly that almost the only group of non-Natives who come to Indian reservations are those who come to take our picture or come to give us charity. Almost no one comes to build a relationship. And I was trying to process all of this through with some of my friends over the phone because, again, they weren't coming to see us. And every time we would start talking about these things, I could feel the anger kind of welling up in me. And soon I have to drop out of the conversation or hang up the phone because I didn't want to start yelling at my friend. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to, to disconnect a little bit. And I talked about it more in the third person, like I read it in the newspaper. This allowed me to engage longer. But then my friend would drop out of the conversation and they would get defensive. Well, we didn't do that to your people. This wasn't our, the result of what we did and soon they would leave the dialogue. And I didn't know how to have a meaningful dialogue that was really honest. And so I was writing a letter. This was like the 10th time trying to get my friends to understand how it felt 
to be Native American living on an Indian reservation in the middle of this country. And in this letter, I said, being Native American and living in the United States, it feels like our Native communities are this old grandmother who has a very large and a very beautiful house. And years ago, some people came into our house and they violently locked us upstairs in the bedroom. Today, they've taken over our house. They're sitting on our furniture. They're eating our food. They're having a party inside our house. Now, they've since come upstairs and they've unlocked the door to our bedroom, but it's much later and we're tired, we're old, we're weak, we're sick, so we can't or we don't come out. But the thing that hurts us the most that causes us the most pain is that virtually nobody from this party ever comes upstairs, seeks out the grandmother in the bedroom, sits down next to her on the bed, takes her hand, and just simply says, thank you. Thank you for letting us be in your house. I wrote that and I'm like, that's it. That's how I'm feeling. I started sharing that. Non-natives, our native people would come to me and say, it's, I've lived here a long time, I've struggled to know how to articulate how it feels, and you're hitting the nail on the head. I would share it with non-Native peoples. And instead of getting defensive and upset, they would come back and say, what does it mean to say thank you? How do we express gratitude to the indigenous hosts of the lands where we're living? What this metaphor does is it changes the paradigm. Instead of talking about victim as oppress or oppressor, we're talking about what I would say is this reversal of roles, which our nation, which likes to call itself inaccurately a nation of immigrants, calling itself a nation of immigrants, re ignores the story in the history of indigenous peoples, as well as the story in the history of African-Americans who were kidnapped, brought here, and enslaved. And we have this nation of immigrants, most of them from Europe, who've never asked for nor have they given, been, been given permission to be here. And they're running around acting like they own the place. Yeah. And we, we have 6 million indigenous peoples who've been removed to the margins, put on these reservations, and now we're treated like unwanted guests in someone else's house. And we need to reverse these roles. We need this nation of undocumented immigrants, again, most of them from Europe, to understand in some very real and practical ways, they are guests in someone else's house. And we need indigenous peoples to understand in some very real and practical ways, we are the host people of the land. And we need to step into our role as the host. And this is really what I'm trying to establish is this reversal of roles so that we can find a way to move forward better. Right? We have people who've lived here for thousands of years who have a lot of wisdom on how to live sustainably in these lands, and we're being left out of the conversation. So we need to, we need to really take this to heart and understand this reversal of roles so that we, we, we can begin to have a much more meaningful and I would say even more productive dialogue than the one we're having now not now in this call, but now in, as a nation around the country. That's really powerful, Mark. Thank you for, for uh, fleshing that out a little bit. I've got another question here that, that somebody put in. Uh, they don't have a name, but it's, the question is, I am a POC graduate student. What would be an effective way to initiate conversation about the issues in the book to a majority white class? So I found, well, the, one of the biggest challenges we face is our nation is not very good at having productive dialogues on race. We really struggle to have both honest and productive dialogues about race. And I would say it's largely because we don't understand the trauma that's going on. Um, there's a greater understanding around the trauma of people of color, but there's very little understanding about what I would refer to as, a, again, the perpetration-induced traumatic stress at a multi-generational and complex level that's afflicting white America. And so we say things that trigger each other. We, we, we use language that isn't conducive to the dialogue. 
We talk about things like white fragility. We talk about things like, um, you know, white privilege instead of being more honest about what, what really is going on there. And we're not, we're not having productive dialogues. And so I find one of the best ways that I try to do, and this is even why I wrote the book, is I find it, it's, it's more effective. I found a lot of success in presenting this information more publicly, like through the book or like through the lectures or even like through my YouTube channel. And then following that up with one-on-one -on, -one on our in-person conversations more relational type things. And one of the things I, I tell people, right, is w when, when we have discussions after reading a book like this, you know, or after I give a lecture on the doctrine of discovery. And once I give a lecture, I will have a series of questions, not entirely unlike the conversation we're having right now. And a lot of the questions in, that, in those contexts are, are coming out of something that was triggered or, or something that feels really pressing or something that was said during, the, during the, the conversation. But we're not getting into the real depth of the matter. And I've learned that if I stay a second day, the next morning after people have got a few REM cycles into them, and their brains begin to sort through some of the information I just gave them, we'll have another dialogue. And that it's different than the dialogue we had immediately after. But the best conversations I've had, the best interactions I've had with people are when I've met them, sometimes even randomly, six to nine months later. And they've been pondering something I said or something I presented or something they saw in the book or in the lecture. And they haven't been able to let it go. They haven't been able to unsee it. And now, six or nine months later, they're ready to actually do something about it. And those are the conversations I live for. Those are the conversations. The other ones are necessary, and I'm very happy to engage in them to move the process along. The conversations I live for happen six to nine months later, after people have really wrestled with the history wrestled with the theology, wrestled with even the, the, the whole process of, of what they're standing on, what we're standing on as a nation, and now they're ready to make some changes, right? If I, if I, if I try to have those dialogues immediately after I gave a lecture, people aren't ready for that at that point. It takes, and, and this is even why we use the, the notion of lament, where if you look in the Christian tradition, lament is not a repentance. Lament is not a turning away. Lament is a sitting in the brokenness and allowing yourself to understand and even experience how broken the situation is. You know, Sung Chan Ra defines lament as, um, um, you know, it's kind of like going to a funeral dirge. You're not going there to raise someone from the dead. You're not going there. You're, you're going there to mourn. You're going there for the purpose of saying goodbye and lamenting and mourning this life that was lost. I tell well, we people all, that. Certainly we can all lament um, man's inhumanity to man. Uh, and I think, um, uh, you know, it, this is largely a, a liberal group that is here with you, at least on Zoom, and including me, whether, believe it or not, whether you, whether whatever you think about my earlier questions or not. And and so we would we would like to to see, you know, whatever needs to happen happen. But the question is, what is that? I mean, what, what has to happen? Um, Could I just add in individuation, Skip? Because sure, indeed, I, I think it does, it has to come from the bottom up, contrary to Mark's assertion that top down. Individuation is a concept of Carl Jung, which is all about the bottom up. Sure. Every individual has something to say that the nation needs to, to hear. One of the challenges I have, and one of the things I try to do effectively, we didn't talk about it as much in this session, 
but I work very hard for people to understand how the things I'm talking about in the book, the white supremacy, the racism, and the sexism are bipartisan values. So even if we look at, I, I mentioned earlier what happened with, you know, how Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the last justice to reference the doctrine of discovery in a Supreme Court opinion in 2005. In 2016, Donald Trump ran on, under the mantra to make America great again. Hillary Clinton responded by telling her supporters that America is great already. At the Democratic National Convention, President Obama jumped into the fray and he said, America is already great. Then Cory Booker, African-American senator from New Jersey, he was endorsing Hillary Clinton from the main stage. And in his speech, he acknowledged that the declaration refers to natives as savages. He acknowledged that the constitution excludes women. And he acknowledged the three-fifths compromise, which was very courageous. Most people in national politics never mentioned those flaws in our nation's foundations. But he ended that section of his speech by telling the Democratic Party, specifically, I would argue, the white ma male base of the Democratic Party, that these things do not detract from our nation's greatness. Now, why would he say that? He would never say that in a room full of people of color. He would never say that to a room full of women. He would never say that to a room full of Native peoples. But he said it on that stage, why? In the book, we identify that, that American exceptionalism is the coping mechanism, mechanism of a nation that's in deep denial of its past as well of, of, as its current racist reality. So we cling, both left and right, to this notion of American exceptionalism. Because if we are not exceptional, if we are not somehow superior, if we do not have a unique relationship with the God of Abraham, justifying our history, then we're just another colonial genocidal nation that's never been held accountable. And that thought is incomprehensible to most people. And so our nation, our infrastructure may be crumbling, our, our, our health system may be very disproportionate to the wealthy, we may have the massive income gaps that we have, but we still claim we are exceptional. Because again, if we're not exceptional, then we don't know what, what, to, what to do with ourselves. Our, and so, our so our even, in the, even in the 2016 election, right? So make America great again, Hillary Clinton said America's great already. During the general election debate, she actually expanded and said America's great because America's good. And Donald Trump turned and looked at her and said, I agree with her. I agree with everything she just said. So they both agreed our past, our history, our foundations were great. They disagreed if we were great in 2016. Donald Trump said no, and Hillary Clinton said yes. See, we thought the 2016 election was about racism versus anti-racism, our quality versus inequality. It wasn't. What we were really debating and voting on here in the U.S. was we, did we want the Republicans and Donald Trump to make us explicitly racist and sexist and white supremacists again? Or do we want the Democrats to work to keep our racism and white supremacy implicit? And I actually have to spend the bulk of my time critiquing the left. The right's easy, right? That's like rebusing a five-year-old. That's fairly simple. The left is a lot more nuanced because they will claim that they are fighting for something when in actually they're working against it. And so you have to work harder to point those things out. And that's a, that's a massive challenge. And that's one of the reasons most of you probably never heard about my campaign. Exactly. Is because the, the two parties worked, literally worked, along with the press to suppress my voice. They wrote me out of stories. They did not include me in dialogues when I was actually on the stage with the other candidates because they didn't want, to, they didn't know what to do with these, these, these points of contention. And so this is the challenge we have. And I, I work very hard and we do this in the book. 
to help people understand that what we're wrestling with is a bipartisan problem. It's not an individual problem. It's not just this president or that historical figure or even this political party. These are bipartisan values that we have as a nation and that we're still using today to prop up these understandings of exceptionalism, of supremacy, and everything else. Mark, could I just say that as a Canadian, I would like to support one aspect of American exceptionalism. I think it might be exceptional that you in the United States have the First Amendment, which is an actual explicit call for people, citizens, to petition their government with grievances. And so that to me is a call to individuation, this concept of Jung. And I think that is the light that we should remember uh, for, for the hope in our future for the seven generations. Thank you very much for your presentation. Well, we always, we always um, are hopefully trying to improve. And uh, Mark, I, the one thing that I would observe is that this North and South America have always been exceptional because they were not populated by human beings until, you know, uh, anthropologists disagree maybe, but it's between 35,000 and, and 11,000 years ago since the first human being was in North America. And one of the things that we can say about the United States is that, that it is perhaps the only country in the world where people are trying to immigrate here from everywhere, okay? They're not trying to escape their previous life, whatever it was. And, and so, you know, these things are, are tough. I agree with you that, you know, that humanity is, is a querulous, garrulous, um, violent species over, you know, the history of humanity. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't see You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite buying your premises here. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I, you know, I respect you, but you know, look, Sung Chan Ra and my um, son-in-law both were born in Korea. Okay, so they were born in Korea, but you know, today, my son-in-law is a, a radiologist in Albany, New York. And if you spoke to him on the phone, you wouldn't know that he had Korean heritage in him. So as human beings, we're, we're changing and evolving. Um, and I'm, I, I still am not seeing what it is you'd like to see because for my lights, I mean, I look at the racial situation in the country and I've looked at it for the last 75 years. And I can tell you in Washington, DC, it's hugely improved from where it was when I was a, um, a 20 year old, 55 years ago, when I uh, came to Washington or to Quantico to be a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. Um, you know, there was, we had Resurrection City on the, on the lawn of, in front of the Lincoln Memorial, and a white person couldn't um, couldn't go east of the Supreme Court without taking their lives in their hands. But today, um, you know that frontier of behavior, let's say, um, has moved back incredibly. I mean, I. I for a decade lived near Lincoln Park in, in uh, Capitol Hill, which is tw 12 blocks from the Capitol, east of the Supreme Court. So there are huge changes in 
the interaction of races that I've just observed in my lifetime. And I agree that they don't happen quickly, but they have been happening and they continue to happen. And yes, um, voices like yours will be heard and may make some change, but I, I don't see how that can be speeded up greatly. I mean, um, unless you have a way, I mean, uh, because I've been interested in these things all my life. Well, I certainly hear what Mark is saying about the institutional um, acceptance of the whole business of manifest destiny and this real subtle understanding that that you know the the colonialists have some sort of a superiority that that is assumed and and what i learned from mark is is that it's so subtle that most of us miss it and it's, it takes a perspective like mark's to point out where those things are and now that I can see that, all of a sudden I see, of course, that's true. And it's been happening for generations, you know, since, well, since thousands of years. I mean, it's, um, it's endemic to the human situation. And yeah. I really, I really appreciate your patience, Mark, in, in having to deal with the kind of- And listening to us. <laughs> Like I said, I think there's a, one of my major goals is I want our nation to have this dialogue. I think it is vitally important. We have to talk about it. Yeah. You know, there's a whole other aspect that we haven't even talked about today, which is the hyper individualism of Western culture, um, which adds a whole nother layer of challenges into these conversations because people can say, well, I'm not racist. I don't believe in those things. I didn't do those things. But the problem is, is we've created systemic racist systems that do our racism and white supremacy and our sexism for us. Right. And, and so if we can't acknowledge that, so yes, you may not feel racist. A certain person may not feel racist but they could still be benefiting from these racist and white supremacist systems that we've created. So even when we look at the First Amendment, right? We talked about that a few minutes ago. And yes, I agree, the First Amendment's vitally important. However, because the Constitution was written, literally written, for the benefit of white landowning men, and we've actually never addressed that. We've never removed that. Well, we have We've amended never, the Constitution 27 times since it's, since our founding. We, so but we, we haven't, haven't taken the racism, sexism, and white supremacy out. We still, slavery is still legal in our, in our constitutionally. If you read the 13th Amendment, it's legal under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system, and we incarcerate people of color at an astronomical rate compared to white people, and we have the highest incarceration rate, even of all our citizens of any country in the world. I agree with you. That's and so so these are the challenges by other names. that that we're facing. Is yes, we have. I mean, it was it was it was in 2020, wasn't it, when Virginia finally passed the ERA, but we <laughs> didn't ratify the 28th Amendment because it had passed the deadline that was set. So even in 2020, we can't decide that we want to constitutionally protect the rights of women in our nation. And this is the challenge we have is, is we are not addressing our problems at a foundational level. Agreed. And so, yes, we have in that, you know, I, we have, we have these rights that are mentioned in our Bill of Rights and everything else, but when you understand that the framework of all that was for the benefit of white men. Truly. And okay. was not including anyone else, we're not solving problems yet. And so this is the conversation that I'm doing my hardest to raise is to recognize we're not dealing with this historical figure or that political party or even that, that religious institution. We're dealing with the fact that we've embedded these things into our foundations. Yep. And if we don't address it there, 
we're not going to fix it. Right. So therefore, we should have the uh, get rid of the filibuster because at the moment we have uh, states like Man Montana <laughs> that might be interfering with good change that 70% of the people agree with you about. Um, right. and, and so we do have a s systematic problem. There's no doubt about that. And, um, and we've got to change it. See, there's a comment. I would even, oh, go ahead. There's a comment from somebody I think is on the phone, Didi, who says, aside from educating, protesting, petitioning, and voting, I do not know what actions to take that make real change. When there is one action to take, there is another systematic battle to take on. So sometimes I feel like I'm going around in circles with action taking. Do you have a comment on that? Yes, again, this is why I go back to the foundations. We're not gonna solve this at, at we're not gonna solve this by protest. We're not even gonna solve this within our legal system, right? when our our legal system is based on interpreting what the constitution who was the constitution written to protect white landowning men guess what it's working incredibly well and so the legal system is not written is not created to give justice to women it's not created to give justice to people of color that's not why we have it and so again we need to address these things at a foundational level but that's the conversation that most, I would say both parties are opposed to having. So let's go back to the, uh, again, the 2020, the, the lynching of George Floyd, right? After that very public lynching, Donald Trump, he, his response was we should ban chokeholds, right? Joe Biden's response was we need to train officers to shoot people in the kneecaps instead of in the chest. Those were their solutions. I was the only candidate who responded to the lynching of George Floyd by saying, we need to remove the white supremacy from our constitution. We have to abolish slavery and remove the, the, the keeping it legal under the criminal justice system. That's where we have to address it. And yet again, like I said, very little was said about that during the, com the, the, the campaign because no one wants to talk about it at that level. People want to believe that the United States of America struggles with racism, sexism, and white supremacy in spite of our foundations. Instead of acknowledging that we wrestle with racism, sexism, white supremacy because of our foundations. Those are the systems we have in place. And so this is the challenge that we're facing is, is the, the, the whole protest, right, all of those things, those are, are meant to, to tweak the things you can see, not to adjust the things that we can't see. And until we can educate ourselves better, until we can acknowledge that this is where our problems lie, we're never going to have the right solutions. Even if you just look, we'll look at one other example, it was it, right now, right? There's the, the, the um, it's, it's the We the People Act, right? This is the, the, the democratic response to all of, the, all of the, the voter suppression that the Republicans are passing at the state level. And the Democrats responded with their We the People Act. Now, the thing you have to know about the difference between the Democratic and Republican parties is the, the, the Republicans are terrified of voters. They have a very explicitly racist, sexist, and white supremacist platform. They're not growing their party. And so the more people who vote, the worse it is for them. So they're terrified of voters. This is why they're, they're putting all these voter suppression rules up. Democrats, their challenge is, is yes, they have a much more diverse base, but they continue to nominate white landowning men from the 1% who want to maintain the status quo. And so their challenge is, is once they nominate people like Joe Biden, they're now afraid their base is going to wander. And so the Democrats are terrified of third party independent candidates because they don't want their voters to have options. 
And so if you read the We the People Act, when the, the, the voter, the voter um, the laws were being, the, the voter um, uh, modifications were being made in the 1970s, there was a qualification, or there was a, a, a law that was enacted that said the two parties could donate two cents to their general election candidates directly um, for every age eligible voter in the US. So in 2020, that meant the Republican Party could give $5 million to Donald Trump and the Democratic Party could give $5 million to Joe Biden. This is a direct donation to those campaigns by the parties, which was allowed in the Voter Reform Act of 1972, I think it was. The For the People Act amends that ruling and it now states that the two parties can donate directly to their general election candidates $100 million. Jesus. <laughs> One, so, right, so, so again, this now gives the two parties an additional $100 million advantage over third party independent candidates. And so again, you have to remember the two parties don't value democracy. The Democrats are, are, are the Republicans are terrified of voters. The, re, the Democrats are terrified of competition and they're both actively working sometimes in conjunction with each other to suppress the democratic process. Yeah, totally. And so this is where we have we, to acknowledge. We, we don't deny that. Uh, these are bipartisan not, values, not, not, and there's not, not a good mention, side and a bad side. Not to mention all our friends on Wall Street. <laughs> Maybe a good campaign slogan is is to do a uh, do away with slavery in the Constitution. That's a pretty good line. <laughs> yeah, I, I I like I said I ran. I, if you go online, my website is still up. It's markcharles2020.com. You can watch my announcement video up there. We have a nine-minute announcement video when we announced in September of 2019. If there was an award for the best announcement video, we would have won. Wow. <laughs> I've literally had people email me in tears saying, wow. I just watched your announcement video. You hit the nail on the head. We, throughout the entire campaign, we had people, including a week before the election, we had people emailing us and saying, how are you not getting more press? Wow. How have I not heard of you? Your video, your issues, you are so right on the things that we're wrestling with as a nation. How are you not getting more press? And it's, again, the things we're fighting for are actually supported by both, or the things we're fighting against are values held by both parties. Well, tell, tell us the name of your, uh your website again, I would like to look at that. So my campaign website is markcharles2020.com. My personal website is wireless Hogan, W-I-R-E-L-E-S-S-H-O-G-A-N. The, that video is actually linked on both of those websites. Um, it's a nine minute announcement video and it lays out the challenges we face as a nation, as well as my proposed solutions. And before we close up here, can you um, give us the, is there a link to your uh, YouTube channel on those websites? If you go to my, my wirelesshogan.com website, W-I-R-E-L-E-S-S-H-O-G-A-N, there's links at the top of that page to my Twitter, my Facebook, my YouTube, my Instagram, and my LinkedIn. Great. Okay. Yeah. And so I'll, I can put that um, directly into the... Uh, into the chat as well. I don't know if that gets shared out or not, but my main, my website. I put that into the chat. It's right there. Yeah. Um, Mark, please understand and, that that uh, I'm all for your your program. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm the most liberal person I know, maybe other than Tim Holmes. <laughs> um, and, and I'm all for it. But I also, um, I guess I see the glass as half full, not half empty. And uh, I, I see a lot of possible or positive 
things that have developed in my lifetime. And, um, and I, I don't know, my, my knowledge of Native American communities is limited. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I cheer when I hear that that some tribes can send all their kids to college and that sort of thing. You know, I, I don't know if my, my children can do that. <laughs> and, and so the, those are great innovations that have developed maybe out of desperation, but, um, you know, I, I know in the Marines, we had a racial issue in 1969, very briefly. And the Commandant of the Marine Corps uh, sent out a, uh, the equivalent of a papal bull that said all Marines are green. <laughs> and I, since that time, I don't recall having particular racial problems within that group of men and women. Um, and, um, you know, not, I'm not saying that there are none, but, um, you know, change can be made. And when people see that it's right, they make it right. They make it happen. In that case, the commandant saw that it was right and he made the, made the change. And, uh, yeah, and you're, things like this where we're, we're able to listen to you really helps with that process. We've gone over time here, but um, I just really want to thank you, Mark, for making this, for taking the time to, to educate us on this stuff. Yep. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your hard work <laughs> and your patience. And uh, looking forward to checking out more of your material on, online. Yeah. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thank you for this opportunity to talk. I appreciate the dialogue. And I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, kind of where this goes from here. So, well, we, uh, we, been... we have had 12 people in the Zoom conference and we still have 11 watching on YouTube, which is quite a good performance. It means that probably over the two hours, we've had over 100 people. And, yeah. and I, uh, I see change come when, you know, some some things that we do cause do cause change, and I I think we have an amplifying effect out into the society that's maybe ten to one against the number of people that actually hit on some of our stuff. Um, you know, I do see change coming through many of the things that I've done in the last eleven years. So. Um, I'm encouraged, and I, I know that if you keep pitching, you're going to um, you're going to see some of the changes you, you want <clears throat> too. I hope so. Um, you know, I'm for for my lights. I mean, my my experiences with the Navajo are that you know, in in my really early youth, when I was like four. Uh, my parents went to Gallup, New Mexico, and uh, my mother bought a lot, a lot of silver and turquoise jewelry. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, so it's not only Navajo's homes I don't go into, I don't go to anybody's homes unless I'm carefully invited there. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, but um, you know, people do support your cause. I think they do. Um, and uh, so, anyway, Tim wants to go paddling. I think so. We'll, we'll have to. Is that true, Tim? Well, yes. I'm. I'm going off to to look at some uh, dolmens, Montana dolmens. <laughs> what? What is it? Dolmens, they're like these big, huge rock structures like you see in Ireland. Oh, like, a, like in Ireland. Yeah. Okay, so Mark, thank you so much for being here today. And um, the YouTube 
replay will be available almost immediately. I'll send you the link uh, to okay. it so that you have access to that. And, uh, and I've got friends that, that have said that they're, they couldn't come to this session, but they'll look at, yeah. the, uh, at the recording. Yeah. So, and let me just give you two more resources. There's two other books written about the Doctrine of Discovery by Native authors. One is a book that came out just recently. It's called The Land is Not Empty by Sarah Augustine. Mm -hmm. I actually had the honor of writing the foreword for this book. And then there's another book that I highly recommend written by Stephen Newcomb um, called <clears throat> Pagans in the Promised Land. And uh, Steve has a very in-depth look at the Doctrine of Discovery as well. And uh, I recommend his book um, whenever I can to people. So those, those are other great resources. There's a lot of people within the Native community and around outside the Native community who are doing a lot of good work on the Doctrine of Discovery. And uh, yeah, I, I hope you'll be able to hear some of these other voices as well. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so All much. Right. Thank, thank you.